and Social Relations at Coventry University here in the UK. Uh, Professor Mike. Thank you so much, Richard, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, um, and uh, welcome to Rising Quibuka. I can't, I can't stress how important this session is within our overall thinking, within our overall program for Rising. Rising is um, a global peace forum that we started in Coventry, a unique uh, partnership between the Coventry Cathedral and the city. The city is the UK's um, city of peace and reconciliation, and the cathedral in its history had a traumatic Recording in during the war uh, that led it to reflect on how we could look positively at moving forward in this complex world of difference, of uh, conflict and of aspiration. So the Rising Global Peace Forum was formed between a, a very active university in this field in peace studies, a city that's uh, focused and committed as a city of sanctuary and of peace and reconciliation <coughs> and a cathedral which brought some experience of its own. We gather peace builders, policy makers and academics from around the world to do a simple thing, to exchange and engage together around brave and innovative strategies for resolving violent conflict. We're a very small part of a major issue for the global uh, scene, but we play a part which I think is subject to, um, I think, good practice, good relationships and, and good objectives. We were launched in 2015, partly by the inspiration of uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, <coughs> may he rest in peace, who was a very good friend of Coventry and who, when we approached him, was very enthusiastic that the, uh, that the groupings within Coventry should reach out and should provoke conversations about these issues, just as he had throughout his life. So launched in 2015, it's evolved now into a powerful force. We're very pleased with its trajectory. And it doesn't simply reflect on the city, but now reaches out as we are uh, this morning. And the Peace Forum has hosted events around the world in Baltimore, in Bogota, in Colombia, in Caen, France, in Monterey, and as well as in London and Westminster. Last year, Rising focused on leadership for peace. <laughs> Underlining the reality that unless our leadership processes are tuned in to the nature of the complex world in which we live in, we're unlikely by ourselves through individual action to generate the sort of society, the sort of communities that we want. And this is writ large when you look at individual circumstances, be they in West Africa or be they in Europe uh, here in, 1920, in 2022. So we looked last year at the concept of leadership for peace, an integrated approach to preventing violence and violent conflicts Defining leadership, not just by the style and approach of leaders, but of a process of collaboration and connectivity between leaders and their followers. In 2022, our work will focus on digital peace, and we're kicking it off in a sense with this conversation this morning, when we're looking at the extent to which generally and in specific situations, among diaspora or in countries such as Rwanda, we want to explore how peace can be built and destroyed through the use of digital media. This isn't a one-way street. Our increased connectivity one with another through digital means has brought huge benefit and openness, but it's also brought and exacerbated and amplified our vulnerabilities. So we need to understand it better. So we're focusing on the use of cyber technology in creating conflict and tensions and how digital media can be used at international, national, community and right down at individual levels to undermine uh, trust and security as well as to enhance cohesive communities. It's what I call the vulnerability of our connections. 
So we have a great conversation planned for today. And let, let me ask simply to pause for a moment to reflect on the personal and the community traumas that happen and are happening. Commanders and all their friends during this period. I'll tell you what, leave it. It's important to maintain the effort to resist the hatred that sometimes that describes. In just 100 days in 1994, around 800,000 people lost their lives in Rwanda. They were specifically targeted as a consequence of inter-ethnic conflict and hatred. Not just the minority Tutsi community, um, but also political opponents generally, irrespective of ethnic origins. Violence was seen as a modality, an acceptable modality. And we know that that cannot be for the future of humankind. And I ask us to pause also to reflect on the current circumstances in Ukraine. The immoral, the unjustified invasion by one country of another and the desperate conditions that are faced by many innocent civilians tied up in this conflict. This is all our problems and all our struggles. And a moment of reflection for their traumas that we must share. Rising Kwibuka is just that. Kwibuka, as I'm told, is remember. Remember, unite, renew. And that must be an encouraging agenda. Never forget where we come from, but always aspire to move to a better place. Our conversation today is about how we arrived at such a terrible place in 1994. And how can we ensure that we never go there again? Never again genocide should be our theme, not just for Rwanda, but for humankind generally. I'm absolutely privileged and honored that we're joined by three remarkable people to help us with this conversation today. His Excellency Busingye Johnson, the High Commissioner for Rwanda in the UK, a distinguished career in the legal uh, services within his country and passionate about promoting positive thinking about our future. Emma Claudine Dzegenlandanya, my apologies if I struggle with your, your name, the communications analyst and a spokesperson for the Office of Government in Rwanda. And my good friend Hippolyte Nitiguri, founder of Be the Peace, a 2020 Yale World Fellow and now a doctoral candidate in our centre at Coventry and I'm privileged to to be associated with his PhD. So we have three remarkable people to kick us off and I will try and keep us to time to allow us to have some conversation and questions. But let's start by His Excellency Basinye Johnson. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Michael Hardy for inviting us, for hosting us uh, to this important conversation. Thank you, Emma Claudine, uh, for being here. You uh, the distinguished guests you have uh, in the room, uh, Rwandans, friends of Rwanda, ladies and gentlemen, people who just uh, want to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you for joining uh, wherever you are. First of all, I want to thank the Rising Global Peace Forum and the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University for hosting today's session and inviting us to speak. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Ippolito Nihigurirwa I met him last Thursday. I think it must have been my first time. 
for his effort in convening this session. Hippolyte delivered to us a moving testimony uh, last week at the uh, Quibuka 28 here in London uh, on his own life and how he survived. And we are grateful to him for sharing his story. Uh, to make never again a reality, we must continue to open fora such as this. It is so important. Uh, and offer people a safe platform, especially survivors of the genocide, watchers, researchers, a safe platform from which to tell their stories uh, free from uh, you know, any feeling of, of intimidation or shame at all. The testimonies and the strength of survivors such as Hippolyte, who you will hear from again, uh, help to educate a wide ed audience and remind us of why we must renew our commitments each year. The voices of survivors need to be heard as they help us to preserve historical clarity which is so important in the age that uh, Professor you alluded to of digital information and how fast it can be. The question uh, that today's session is about is how could the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994 come to pass? One of the key tropes uh, which genocide deniers cling on is the notion that the genocide against the Tutsi was a spontaneous act of tribal violence. This is fundamentally false. It is a narrative spread first by the representative of the genocidal regime then in, in Kigali at the United Nations in 1994 when what was happening in Kigali was being debated and then was trumpeted by exiled genocide perpetrators after that. When we discuss how the genocide against the Tutsi came to pass, we need to understand that this false narrative perpetrated by perpetrators of the spontaneous uprising of violence is an intentionally deceptive denialist rhetoric about the genocide. It's, it does so intentionally. Uh, Gregory Stanton, uh, Professor, you probably are very much aware of the, the founding president of Genocide Watch, developed the 10 stages of genocide, which explains the different stages which lead to genocide. Nearly all 10 stages are applicable to the Rwanda situation and to the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. Genocide never just happens. There is always a deliberately enabling climate which facilitates it. The victims of the, of the genocide were forced to endure and the many stages of genocide. In 1959, hundreds of thousands of Rwandans already identified and targeted as Tutsi were attacked and pushed out of the country. They sought asylum, refugee, refuge, using the nearest and safest border. Others who stayed endured unspeakable discrimination over the next four decades and would later become the victims we mourn this week. For colonialism to be effective, it demanded the colonizers to divide the people to better rule over them. That happened across the globe where colonization happened. The colonial government embedded differences in population by classifying citizens as either Hutu or Tutsi or Twa in our national IDs. Uh, maybe I should remind our audience that Rwanda had IDs uh, very long ago introduced by the Germans. Why they had IDs, I don't know. That probably would be another day for another, another story for another day. Uh, because, you know, as, as far away as 1925, I don't know how many Rwandans were able to read and write and uh, even know the use of uh, the ID, but they had an ID written on Rwandan. Then in 1932, 
the, the Rwandan was changed to the ethnic uh, difference. So this classification enabled post-colonial government to achieve further division and hatred among citizens. The post-colonial government identified and disseminated the persecution of Tutsi this time as a policy. To give an example, the genocidal regime established a system of quotas, supposedly to assure equitable distribution of resources and opportunities to all Rwandans. In other words, if, if education is an opportunity, Rwandans were supposed to access education by quotas. It was not by passing an exam or by reaching an age of starting school or by having a scholarship to go and study at college. It, it, it was now by court on quota basis, uh, how many from one ethnic group and how many from another ethnic group. In reality, the intent of the system was the victimization of the Tutsi by ensuring their enrollment in school or in the civil service was seriously curtailed. Citizens came to believe that they were different much later and that Tutsi could be violated with impunity. Next was dehumanization, you know, the practice of referring to people uh, by other names. Tutsi were referred to as snakes, as cockroaches. Radio stations such as the RTLM, which you probably have heard about, broadcast hate speech daily directly to huge swathes of the population and incited uh, the regular violence and killings, which began uh, long before 94. Then there was polarization where the Tutsi were identified as the common universal enemy. The 10 commandments of the Hutu, uh, probably that you know about, or we will have a conversation on, published first in the late 50s, then republished in 1990 in a, in a, a newspaper uh, called Kangura, a anti Tutsi vitriolic Hutu power in Rwanda language newspaper. It identified the Tutsi as the common enemy and stated that the Tutsi should be shown no mercy. The rhetoric of ethnic separatism was rife from the top of the government and extended into society through the tentacles of their mass media campaigns. In the lead up to 1994, citizens were mobilized, empowered, and provided with the resources to carry out a genocide. Lists of Tutsi families and individuals to be killed were drawn intensified messages of hatred were spread over the radio. The Inherahamwe militia were organized and the government imported vast quantities of weapons, local weapons. The government institutions that would deter crime, such as the police, the army, local administration, mayors, governors, they were all the ones who instead led the genocide. Rather than prevent killings, they were required to deliver reports of how many had been killed, how many were still being hunted for. Even in church, pastors were openly preaching someone that expressed sympathy to the genocide ideology and made citizens feel this way of thinking was safe and acceptable even before the almighty God. During the genocide, many Tutsi sought sanctuary in churches, but these two were to become genocide sites. Instead of sanctuary, the Tutsi found extermination, sometimes at the hands of the clergy. Today, many churches in Rwanda stand as memorial sites and their former pastors are in jail after trials by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda or, for, or by Rwandan systems or they are, refugee, they are fugitives from justice hiding in different places in the world. The genocide which began on the 7th, I make this case, was a planned systematic government sponsored mass implemented undertaking which left over a million people dead, many others injured, others victims of rape, others orphaned or displaced from their homes. When we look beyond Rwanda, 
at the response of the international community, we should have seen deepening condemnation and intervention. Instead, we saw intellectual debates about at the UN, sorry, uh, at the UN Security Council about what constitutes genocide. Even the smallest of actions, such as the jamming of the Erutalem hate radio, which was inciting killers, was disregarded. And what prevailed was shameful paralysis by the international community. Inside the country, we saw cases such as the 11th of April massacre at a, a, a school, a Ecole Technique Officielle, that's a French name of a school, where the UN peacekeepers tasked with guarding Tutsi uh, people who had run to them for protection, pulled back, climbed their lorries and left over 2000 Tutsis utterly exposed to be slaughtered. There were no structure left to stop the genocide. Rwanda had been completely abandoned during its time of greatest need. Over 100 of the darkest days in our history, you refer to that professor, over 1 million people lost their lives. The entire social fabric of our nation was destroyed. There was no nation to speak of. The environment that enabled the genocide had been cultivated over many years, fueled by leadership that openly encouraged ethnic extremism. Today, the culture of responsible, unifying leadership at all levels has firmly taken root. No leader can today claim that Rwandans are different like they are from two planets. No leader can again incite citizens to send other citizens out of Rwanda through the Nyabarongo River. The Nyabarongo River is a river that connects with the River Kagera into the Lake Victoria, through the Nile, through uh, you know, Sudan and so on. So politicians would say that uh, Tutsis came from that part of the world in the Horn of Africa and the Nile was the easiest route to send them over. And some politicians would go and incite citizens to send Tutsi to the, the, the Horn of Africa through the river Nyabarongo, which flows largely through Rwanda. No army leader can permit a woman, can, can, sorry, sorry. No army leader can again brag about preparing an apocalypse and actually do so and get away with it. No leader can permit a, a, can permit a woman to be raped, a school child to stand in class, a citizen to be stopped at a checkpoint, denied a place in school, or a scholarship on account of ethnicity. These ridiculous things, my friends, dehumanized our people in very unimaginable ways. 28 years after the genocide, Rwanda. Nana, because there is a bit of a Lord, please, would you kindly put our systems onto mute? Thank you. Sorry, I commission. Please continue. Yeah. 28 years after the genocide, Rwanda has been transformed for the better and for good. We now have a peaceful and prospering nation that we are proud of and something precious to defend. Crucially, the values of national unity, cohesion, inclusivity underpin our development journey. We call this ideology Ndumunya Rwanda. That is a Kinyarwanda word meaning I am Rwandan. The same way you can say I am uh, American, I am this kind of uh, uh, nationality, which means that we are all Rwandans, we are all indivisible, and we are stronger united. Dear friends, the second question that I wanted to reflect on is how do we achieve, how do we reach never again. When we speak of never again, we must remember that this is not an objective unique to Rwanda. 
it is a global goal. And thank you, Professor, you alluded to that. Never again must be global. Can be for all of us. It can't be a one country objective. To achieve never again, we must permanently, permanently be on the lookout and defeat genocide ideology. Any ideology that promotes ethnic extremism, that differentiates, that discriminates the people because they are that people, it doesn't matter how small it is, that will be a seed. And we all know that things become, come from seeds. Once you plant a seed and you allow it to grow, it's no longer one seed, it's many seeds. I opened my remarks by commending Hippolyte, Mr. Hippolyte, and emphasizing the importance of giving testimony uh, last week. In Rwanda, we are committed to protecting the voice, these voices as they truly explain and expose the genocide ideology we strive to defeat. Each and every year, we will return, whether it be in Kigali or in London or over Zoom or, or, or re with renewed purpose and to remember and honor the victims, protecting memory, valuing testimony, amplifying Rwandan voices helps to safeguard historical clarity, educate the generation, the next generation, drown out those spreading divisionist rhetoric and affirm our commitment to never again. As Rwandans, we consider it a duty to share our history with each other and with the international community. We cannot be complacent in this duty as we must instill, and we must instill this sense of duty in the next generation. Global awareness of the threat of genocide is important. While it was Rwandans who were the victims in 1994, the genocide against the Tutsi was an international crime. Every country is duty bound to prevent it, to repress it, or to punish it. If a country thinks it is immune, even Rwanda thought it was immune. No country can be immune unless it does the things that need to be done in order to prevent. If we do not understand the root causes of genocide, the stages of genocide, and how to build peaceful, inclusive societies, then humanity is condemned to repeat the mistakes of our past. Education, Professor, is a critical tool in ensuring that genocide never happens again. Rwanda has incorporated peace education along with the history of our genocide into the national curriculum. It took time, understandably. There was a lot of debate to agree what is the content. We strongly believe these efforts should be expanded globally. Evil spreads faster than good. And allowing destructive ideologies to settle, especially in the minds of young people, is dangerous everywhere in the world and it constitutes a threat. We have seen a number of schools in the United Kingdom adopt genocide education, and we are very, very grateful for that. But it is not enough, and we will work for more in the UK and globally. I want to commend Coventry University very, very much and the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations for leading this effort. The government of Rwanda's policies have been shaped by our unique history. The government is committed to inclusive, citizen-centered growth and development, so Rwandans can live with the dignity they deserve. We are committed to working with partner countries for the ends of peace, security, and justice. Rwanda's commitment to peace is seen through its contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping effort. Despite difficulty, Rwanda is the largest contributor of police, the fourth largest contributor of troops globally to UN peacekeeping missions. Rwanda has also stepped up to help those most in need and has developed into a safe, 
and secure haven for refugees and asylum seekers. After Libya's fall, human traffickers abandoned hundreds of migrants ready to do the dangerous journey across the Mediterranean Sea. The West, after uh, Gaddafi's fall, abandoned them there. Nobody was willing to take them in. Rwanda, despite the difficulties, worked with the international uh, uh, agencies responsible. And these people are now in Rwanda making life and at least able to have a roof on their top, on their, on their, on their heads and able to sleep, wake up in the morning, have three meals a day and look for some work and their children can go to school. That was one. The other day when Afghanistan fell flat in 24 hours, Rwanda uh, evacuated and took in a complete girls school of probably more than 400 girls. They, are, they continued their education working with their, their, their uh, administrators. That school is now running. So we have tried to be, because of our history, we have tried to create safety and security for people who need it. Because at any given moment in the world, there are people who need it. We are having other conversations with other countries, including the United Kingdom. I'm sure it must have followed everything in the, in, in the media today about uh, uh, hosting people who seek migration and who, seek, who are refugees, uh, especially in order to break down criminal rings of human trafficking who engage in getting money and trying to get people cross the English Channel or cross the Mediterranean Sea. As nations and individuals, we endeavor to walk the talk and do everything in our means to become exporters and harbingers of peace. Of course, there's another pressing threat to never again, which we have not touched on. That is ensuring justice is served on perpetrators. At our Kibuka 28 last week, author and researcher Andrew Wallace succinctly described what trials, why trials are so important. Trials give much, and I'm quoting him, trials give much needed solace to victims and survivors, some sense of closure, some sense of right finally being done. We must permit no impunity for genocide fugitives, no matter how long it takes or how difficult it might be. All countries should establish laws to punish the crime of genocide. And if they are not yet in place, reference should be made to international law and conventions to ensure that justice is dispensed. To permit genocide fugitives asylum or even citizenship, and for these facts to lead to the delay or denial of justice for the genocide, emboldens the genocide ideologues and their generational successors. Those who find impunity overseas only dig in and seek platforms to deny the genocide and spread hateful ideologies. All that needs to be done is that the suspected perpetrators who remain free, at least five of whom live in the United Kingdom, have their day in court, be put to their defense, and let justice be done openly. Ladies and gentlemen, we must unfortunately acknowledge that we are still in the throes of the 10 stages of genocide. We have now arrived at the final stage, which is denial. The stage that for survivors ensures the crime of genocide never comes to an end. Deniers of the genocide against the Tutsi are the ethnic extremists who remain committed to divisionism and hatred. They are often the perpetrators and the associates who fled and found impunity abroad. The deniers want to nip our nation, national unity and Rwandans as Rwandans in the bird. All the deniers have known and depend on is ethnic extremism. And without it, there will be no more. They employ a number of tactics to spread their lies and deception. The misinformation they spread includes 
minimization of the genocide by deliberately stating reduced numbers of deaths, the theory of double genocide to say that we know uh, during the genocide, there are uh, other people who died. Uh, therefore, there was, uh, there was another genocide, which is wrong, which is not supported by any, any historical fact, uh, because the targeted group of people for the genocide is known and there's no debate about it. And lastly, deliberately refusing to call the genocide what it is, the genocide against the Tutsi. We ought to challenge this propaganda with facts, fight disinformation with information. Disturbingly, the voices of deniers and their mouthpieces continue to find safe haven in academia and in the international media. There are, these are systematic gaps which facilitate denial, such as the underrepresentation of Rwandan voices and survivors' voices. We are addressing these gaps by reaching out to more researchers, more academia, both Rwandan and international, to rectify this serious problem. The voices of this handful of individuals should never be able to find and sustain the platform. We are working with institutions so they understand the gravity of giving a platform to genocide ideology and denial. Genocide deniers or even perpetrators and their mouthpieces cannot be allowed to hide behind free speech to spread hateful, venomous, and dangerous ideology. We are fortunate we have an active community who stand up against institutions when they are remiss in these duties. We live in an age of disinformation and misinformation. And we have come to accept this because there are some good things about it, but there are some real challenges with them. But we have developed methods to filter through the noise and find accurate information. There is a line, ladies and gentlemen, and this line is genocide denial. Giving a platform to a genocide denier is a, an abuse of freedom of expression, of free speech, and it does incalculable harm to the survivors and to our world. Hate speech isn't free speech. Genocide denial should not freely be expressed because genocide denial is a crime. In Rwanda, Genocide denial is punishable by law. In Italy, in France, in Belgium, laws have been enacted to punish genocide denial, uh, denial of the genocide against the Tutsi. And there are further 22 European countries with laws that address Holocaust denial. We encourage and support all countries who are willing to pursue this path to stamp out denial. For the sake of the survivors, we must commit to challenging deniers push back against genocide denial in all its hideous forms and replace it with clarity and unity. Whether it be through the law or by individually challenging genocide denial, wherever we encounter it, we can defeat this menace. When Rwandans have been tested, whether it be reading blunted denial in a newspaper or facing aggression from those who seek to subvert us from beyond our borders, our unity and our resolve have always triumphed. Those who in the service of ethnic separatism used terror and killed our people, claiming they are pursuing the rights of native Rwandans, all failed and their leaders have been brought to justice. Today, we are more united than ever and we are determined to consolidate this unity through the next generation of young Rwandans who will take our country to new heights. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, to ensure never again becomes a reality, we must be vigilant to the threats we face. It can't, never again cannot simply come from the blue. It can only come from the actions we take. We must commemorate every year with renewed purpose so we can steal our resolve and commit to the fight against genocide ideology and denial. Any action which seeks to divide Rwandans along ethnic lines must be identified and challenged. We must support and partner with all those willing to walk that path with us to the ends of justice. 
to the ends of peace, to the ends of truth. Dear friends, today Rwanda is safe and secure and we are immensely, immensely grateful to those who have shown leadership, partnership and friendship on our journey of reconciliation and healing. 28 short years ago, we did not know we would be where we are. We now have a precious national unity and inclusive society to defend. I thank you very much for your kind attention, Professor, and look forward to the conversation and to hearing from the other distinguished participants in the forum. Thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Excellency, thank you so much for a very powerful and uh, hugely helpful framing of, uh, of this conversation. You, you uh, under, underline the importance of seeing our work as a movement and not a moment. It's not a thing that happens in 100 days and somehow can be analyzed and studied. It's the beginning of a movement towards the destination that you've set out, the never again destination. So thank you for that. What you've underlined as well is that this isn't simply an issue for Rwanda. This is a global issue, a concern for all of us to set the standards and the issues that we need to uh, confront and resolve. It's often been my view, um, Excellency, that the existential threats facing humankind are not the more obvious ones of climate, which is serious, of absolute poverty and disease, which is serious for so many. Uh, the big main threat is our, our seeming inability to cope with difference and to get along with each other uh, without resorting to violence in, in expressions of our difference. And you've set out an agenda here through your exhortation for coping with difference in the notion of removing ethnicity that has no place in humanity in terms of social relations. And you've also highlighted the power that education has with our younger people. So never again, as you said, must come when we've developed uh, an understanding of how we can trust ourselves to cope in multi-ethnic and multi-cultural uh, communities in the way that Rwanda is seeking to display on the global stage. And we, as the global audience, must take stock, must watch, must be critical when it's appropriate, but also must be uh, learning when we can. Above all else, you highlighted towards the end, um, Excellency, your commitment to information and how transparency and information, how reality and facts must inform the campaign against denial, the campaign against uh, continuing with um, ethnic difference. And that's a very good segue into our second speaker. Um, Emma Claudine, I'm so pleased that you're able to join us. You're one of, um, uh, I know, a, a couple of journalists who begun with Radio Salas, a, a University of Rwanda radio station that designed its programming and served as a program manager in that radio station for several years. You dealt with the very truth and, and, and uh, facts that His Excellency referred were so important. Um, but you also are aware, as currently the communications analyst at the Office of Government, of the importance of, of misinformation and disinformation and how we must cater, and, and, uh, cater for that and, and strategize against it. So I welcome you to uh, our discussion and thank you very much for joining and uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be with you uh, to talk about uh, this. Uh, it's really a very big struggle in Rwanda to make sure uh, genocide uh, happens never, never again around the world uh, and starting with our country. So it has been uh, a long journey. And uh, indeed, when we look at the media, we realize uh, the genocide is really prepared. Uh, the genocide is all understood by the, the, the regime. Uh, and if, if it doesn't, it can't happen. So I've prepared um, 
a PowerPoint that I wanted to share with you uh, to see the role of media uh, in the genocide against the Tutsi and their role, especially their role in rebuilding Rwanda. Because as you stated, we now remember, uh, but we focus on uh, uniting and, uh, and uh, rebuilding uh, the country um, in the theme, remember, unite, renew. So it was um, a long journey, as I was saying. Um, and if I give you kind of a background, how Rwanda, Rwandans understand media or take media, uh, media as a communication channel has been considered as uh, an important tool in the pre-genocide Rwanda. And even today, uh, Rwandans really uh, believe in what is uh, said in the media. So we used it to say like it was announced on radio. Uh, and if someone tells you it, it was announced on radio, it means it is authentic, it is true. You, you don't need to, to double check. You don't need to ask someone else if that's true or not. If it has been said or announced on radio, that's authentic, that's true. So this made it a very easy for Rwandans to buy and do what media said and ordered them to do, uh, including uh, the worst of crimes, which uh, is the genocide against the Tutsi. So this mindset is almost the same even today, um, even if things have changed a little bit because now we also have social media, people can communicate very much and uh, the people who are not even journalists can communicate, uh, but they still believe very much in what is announced in the media. Um, so how Rwandans use media today? Maybe before I talk about uh, the background, the history, um, today, uh, when we refer to the data uh, of some of our research done, like the media barometer that was um, done in 2021, um, they showed that um, Rwandans listen radio at a rate of 94%. So only 50% watch TV, uh, and this is really a very current data because in the, the media barometer of 2018, the number was really very low for the people watching television. And for social media, uh, for 20% of the people uh, are on social media in Rwanda, uh, online publications are read by that first uh, percent of uh, the, the population. And currently, print media is at 2.6%. Uh, the percentage of the print media was not as low in the past, of course. Uh, it's because currently we almost have no print media uh, because um, back in 2020, uh, fighting against COVID-19, we discouraged printing uh, to avoid uh, paper and the, 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 the spread of the pandemic. Um, but the rate of the people who listen to radio has been really very high, and you can still see how it is very high. I'm showing this to you to show the impact uh, radio RTRM had had in, in Rwandans um, to, to spread the, the genocidal ideology. So let's go back, um, uh, let's go back in, in, um, uh, in before 1960 in Rwanda. So in Rwanda before 1960, we had Kinyamateka newspaper. So this Kinyamateka newspaper was a Catholic church newspaper and it was the only one uh, published at that time. It started being published in 1933. And it started uh, with a good, um, uh, a good line, if I can say, uh, because it was publishing country news. But and even in 1950, it tried to behave like professionally by opposing to the segregation that was being uh, spread at that time uh, with uh, uh, Hutu and uh, Tutsi and Ditwa ethnics put in, in, in uh, identity cards. Uh, but later in 1960, even the Kinyamateka, that Kinyamateka newspaper, uh, the Catholic Church newspaper, started publishing the Parmehutu ideology. Uh, so we will run a bit more about this ideology as we go on. Um, 
So the Parmehutu uh, was one of the party and it started a newspaper as well. Uh, and this was uh, uh, back in 1970, but before that in 1961, Radio Rwanda has started broadcasting. Even if it was trying to be kind of a professional media, but also we can't ignore it was uh, a government uh, media, meaning it, it had to publish what the, 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 the government of that time uh, believed in. So the Rwanda Carrefour d'Afrique was the Parmehutu newspaper, uh, which um, had content with opinions that were really disrespect, disrespect, disrespectful to the Tutsi, uh, most often referring to the Tutsi as the ones who always want slavery. Um, in Kenya Rwanda, we, we, we use the word Gasha Kabuhache, so meaning they constantly uh, showed uh, the Hutu that the Tutsi don't, can't be friends, they, they can't be neighbors, they don't like them, they, 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 they are the people who really want slavery. And those were the constant uh, opinions that were published in the Parmehutu uh, uh, party newspaper. They were constantly referring to the Tutsi as the ones who oppressed the Hutu for 400 years, meaning referring to the, to the, uh, uh, the time uh, we had uh, um, uh, before colonialism. Uh, so remain, reminding the Hutu that they have now been awakened, they can't uh, ignore that fact. So constantly uh, disseminating hate uh, and making sure that the people, the, the Hutu understand they are different from the Tutsi and they are not friends, they are not neighbors, they are not the same, things like that. So. Um, Back in 1973, then it was uh, the, the Second Republic, uh, the vehicle by the ruling regime, uh, the, the, the media remained the vehicle by the ruling regime to disseminate the same opinions, disrespectful to the Tutsi uh, in the media over the years. And at, at that time we had uh, Radio Rwanda, we had the Chinyamateka newspaper I've been talking about, but you have new newspapers created like Invaho and Raro Rev, but also those two newspapers were um, created uh, or were pro-government. In 1990, um, that's where uh, things get worse. If I can say, uh, we had the military party system. Uh, and with the military party system, that's when uh, Arab PF Imhotani started the journey to, 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 to come back to Rwanda to make sure that uh, all the people are repatriated and, and, and uh, come back to Rwanda. So the civic war started in 1990, and uh, we had the military party system. Many newspapers were then created. Most of them had the, the genocidal ideology. Few were the ones opposed to that genocidal ideology. Uh, public newspapers and the radio were an official channel for the, the, that ideology. And the media in Rwanda during the period uh, after uh, uh, the research and everything, it has been classified as hate media. So meaning uh, with that, you can understand really how things were very worse. Um, between 19 and 94, um, during the, the military party uh, system uh, and the civic war, um, we had Kangura magazine. There were so many newspapers, uh, but I will mention a few who really had a, a very big uh, role in the hate speech and uh, the, the genocidal ideology uh, spreading. So including the Kangura magazine and Radio ATRM and Radio, uh, but Radio Muhabura was a bit different. So I bring it in here and I wanted to talk about it a little bit. So Radio Muhabura was the Rwanda Patriotic Front. Um, I mean, RPF Imhotani Radio. And this radio was promoting the armed resistance to the extremist Rwandan government. So um, people used to listen to it in, in a secret, uh, but Radio Muhabura also tried to bring in 
so many clarity, but people didn't want to, to, to hear or understand, uh, like accusing um, the Rwandan government of genocide and also accusing the Rwandan government for promoting resistance to, 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 to power. Uh, um, I mean, uh, ex ex um, wanting the government to, 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 to to, I mean, promoting uh, around the citizens uh, the resistance to Hutu power and to the Habyarimana government uh, and the dissertation by military. Uh, but it had a small impact because of the following. Um, even if it gave hope to the Tutsi who were targeted, who were oppressed by the government, by the regime, but uh, uh, it regularly discussed, uh, and uh, because it, it regularly discussed the return of the Rwandan diaspora in the creation of a new government, it had limitations. Radio Mahabura had a much smaller audience, uh, and probably because it broadcast in English instead of Kenya Rwanda, and most of the people uh, listening to to, to Kenya Rwanda in Rwanda, and the, many of them were uh, knew the English language. I mean, the, the French language instead of English. It was kind of a turnaround uh, later in in uh, nineteen uh, later in, in almost in, in two thousand. So it was listened to in hiding. If you were inside Rwanda and people caught you listening to Radio Mohabura, it was a kind of a crime. Uh, so uh, people used to listen, it, to listen to it in hiding. Uh, they did not cover the whole country. And the most importantly was on shortwave instead of FM, which made uh, a bit difficult for people to listen to. So that's how, even if it was trying to really do that fight, but it had a, a kind of a small impact on the Rwandan population. So now we had RTRM. Uh, Radio Televisio Libre de Mercorin, RTRM, uh, broadcast in July, was created in July uh, 1993, and it broadcast until 1994. Uh, and it was really very wide listened to. Uh, I, 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 I can even say that it was listened to more than Radio Rwanda at that time. And it really read against the ongoing peace in Arusha the, because uh, at the time we had the peace agreement between the government of Rwanda um, and uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Front uh, and the, the RTRM was against this. Uh, the purpose of uh, RTRM was publicly defined as the defense of Hutu power. Uh, and Hutu power was really a very extremist um, ideology, uh, making sure that the Hutu understand that they have the power, they, they, they are not the same as the Tutsi, as I was saying. All those ideology and uh, hum the dehumanization and everything uh, was uh, through the, the Hutu power ideology. So it played a crucial role in creating the atmosphere of uh, charged racial hostility uh, that allowed the Rwandan genocide to occur through talk show, everyday talk show, all the songs that they used to, to, to air, and even during the news. Uh, um, so Erterem uh, was a source of propaganda, inciting hatred and the violence against the Tutsi uh, uh, and the, against the, the Hutu who were for the peace accord and against the Hutu who married the Tutsi and advocated the annihilation of all Tutsi in Rwanda. So it was really very, very big uh, and very clear uh, without like going around or using some some um, other words, but they were clear about it and they were open. So RTRM daily reporting was about um, the latest massacres, um, what they did around, not the massacres, uh, the, not the massacres during the, the of the civic war, but the massacres that are happening in the genocide. So reporting like these have been. Uh, Massacred how many to see and applauding them for doing that, uh, reporting war victories, reporting a political event in a way that promoted the anti Tutsi agenda. Uh, they really did whatever they could do to dehumanize and uh, degrade the, the Tutsi, uh, referring to them uh, and to the RPF as cockroaches. So you can imagine if you if, if people are not being called human anymore and they are being called as cockroaches, 
uh, to make it easier for the Hutu to, to, to do the killings. So 6 April 1994, uh, I can point it to that because after the, the plane crash of uh, the former president of Germana, HRM radio called to the Hutu to, extermin to exterminate the Tutsi uh, because they were saying that they were the ones who shot the plane. So openly on radio and calling all the Hutu to kill all the Tutsi, saying they, they, they shot the plane. Uh, and using the words like meaning cutting long trees and the long trees meaning the, the, the Tutsi, uh, the kind of humanize, the humanization we were talking about and calling, killing Gukora, like to work. So meaning if you go and you kill people, you, you, you're working. So meaning uh, uh, urging their conscience and making sure that they don't feel guilty or anything and they feel like they are doing the, the good thing. Um, so this was RTRM. Uh, some of the examples of uh, RTRM famous presenters, um, the, the language they used frequently on radio, uh, like the one known as Cantano, uh, he called those who have guns to immediately go to the, the, the cockroaches and circle them and kill them. Uh, you, you understand it, it was being um, called away like that uh, and uh, telling uh, the whole audience on radio. It was not just like uh, pointing to somebody or someone else. So Valerie Bemerici uh, was the only female animator on uh, RTRM. Uh, and uh, on her side, she called for machete. So she was like, Cantano is being generous or Cantano is being human. So for her, she said, uh, she said like, do not kill those cockroaches with a bullet cut them to pieces with a machete. So it was really very, um, I don't know how I can categorize this, but it, it was extreme. So George Rugu was a white man from Belgium. Uh, he was also working at the RTRM and he preached the Hutu power despite his non-Rwandan origins, urging listeners to kill the Tutsi and told the listeners that uh, graves were waiting to be filled. You, you understand? And that was, the radio, which was widely uh, listened to by most of the Rwandans at the time. Uh, another uh, media to point to was the Kangura magazine. Uh, and Kangura magazine uh, was a Chinyar and the French language magazine established in 1990, uh, following the invasion of the Rwanda Patriotic Front and served to, to, to stop ethnic hatred. The magazine was, um, uh, I can say, the, the equivalent print of uh, the Eritrean radio station because it really it was full of uh, ideology, genocide ideology content. Um, it was publishing articles uh, that were really crit criticizing the RPF and uh, of the Tutsi in general with sensationalist news uh, that was passed by word of mouth through the largely illiterate population. So meaning the people who could read it uh, used to continue narrating the stories to all the people. And the most importantly, uh, they used the public meetings to read what has been written in, in, in the Kangura newspaper. So, um, so that all the people can know even the illiterate one. So Kangra Magazine was key in, in, in fomenting the extremism and in turn uh, becoming the mouthpiece of the, the CDR. CDR was another party that raised uh, uh, back in 1992 and it was a very, very extremist um, than MRND. Uh, and they were campaigning for the pure, pure Hutu nation and the prohibited Rwandans with uh, Tutsi grandparents from joining. You understand if you you you, you even um, forbidding people prohibiting people to join the party, uh, it's it's understandable what they they wanted. 
Uh, this was the coalition for the defense of the republic. That that what CDR meant in 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 in, um, in detail. So um, Congress seemed to know what was going to happen even before it did, because being uh, supported by CDR and most of the them being um, in the ruling regime, they 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 had so many information and they could ask if it was not the regime who had pre planned for that to happen, how could the Kangura know that? So it was clear that it, things were planned and Kangura used to, to, to publish them in advance, kind of, um, um, kind of telling the people what is going to happen, but um, ensuring, making sure that they, they, they take from those uh, publications to act, to do something, especially to hate the Tutsi and to be ready to, to start killing them without, uh, uh, we, 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 without uh, judging yourself or thinking you're doing a bad thing. Uh, Kangura content, if we can go through some of the content, like in this issue published in December 99, in 1990, it was the first publication of the Hutu Ten Commandments. So the Hutu Ten Commandments uh, are very known to have um, to have pushed the genocidal ideology very much, uh, and uh, the, the hatred uh, by Hutu to, to Tutsi. Uh, I have extracted some examples of those commandments to see how really um, very genocidal they were. Uh, for example, the education sector school pupils, students, teachers must be majority Hutu. So it was just a rule, one of the rule or, or, or the commandment. And like uh, the Rwandan armed forces should be exclusively Hutu. So with an armed uh, force, uh, of one um, only Hutu. And the experience of the October 1990 war has taught us a lesson and that, that what they were saying, no member of the military shall marry a, Hutu, uh, a Tutsi. And uh, like the number eight commandment, the Hutu should stop having mercy on the Tutsi. So it's 10 commandments. These are the few I just pull up, like a sample to show how um, the Hutu were uh, encouraged to hate, to hate and to make sure that they don't have any relationship, any kind of friendship or any mercy, as they say, uh, 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 towards the Tutsi. Um, the propaganda of Kangura targeted women in particular, accusing the Tutsi women of seducing Hutu in order to spy on them and mortify them, but only bearing the children of other Tutsi. And like in the editorial in, of 9 February, uh, they stated, let us learn about uh, the Imhotani, Imhotani meaning not only the, the armed force, the, the patriotic front, but also the supporters and let us exterminate every last of one of them. So meaning they, they wanted to showcase that every Tutsi is in Hotani, every Tutsi is a cockroach, uh, meaning we, 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 they, they needed to exterminate them. Emma, two or three minutes, if you may. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So these are the examples of uh, the, the hate speech uh, that we can see and how the media used the propaganda, including, uh, including uh, Eritrea mostly and the Kangura, uh, and also um, how media was really powerful to, 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 to disseminate the ideology and to make it easier for the genocide to happen. Uh, but after the genocide, uh, uh, we have uh, public media outlets, we have uh, community media outlets, we have commercial media outlets and religious media outlets. In total, we have 30 radio stations uh, and uh, we have 13 TV stations. With these uh, uh, multiple media, um, we, media, we know that media has been playing an important role in, in, in rebuilding and developing Rwanda as 
instead of you know, having the same role of before the genocide, but now it has to play a role in rebuilding and developing Rwanda. At the same time, uh, the government of Rwanda ensures that no hate media exists in Rwanda anymore. And uh, some of the measure, measures have been taken, like uh, we know that yes, media and the, the Rwandan citizens in, in general, they, they, they need freedom of speech and they have it, uh, but we need to have some roles uh, to regular everything. So we have access to information law. To, uh, to, to allow media to, to access information and to work freely. But we also have a media law that we established in 2013 that gives right to open a media house or an outlet, but also sets boundaries to make sure that we don't go back to media hate speech that led Rwanda to genocide. And we have media self-regulatory body uh, with a media code of conduct where the media fraternity can go uh, and regulate themselves according to what they, they publishing and how they think it's uh, uh, affecting the population. So the learnings could be uh, media has uh, impact on the society, whether traditional media or citizens media. And we have to understand it is very key to analyze what is broadcast. Uh, and to ask us questions like, what will be the impact on the audience? Is it being the root of hate, the distraction? You know, is it being the root of negative behavior? Is it alarming? And if it is, we need to act accordingly and as soon as possible because we know what um, it, it did before uh, the genocide. Media cannot disseminate the genocidal ideology if the leaders do not support that. So if the, the, the ruling regime is not supporting the genocidal ideology, media can do that. So it is the leadership responsibility um, to ensure media is well regulated and do not harm the audience. Uh, and freedom of speech, sometimes it has a limit So because self-regression is key and it is important to be able to differentiate good and bad and it is important to understand that there is no freedom guarantee to people who disseminate hate speeches, because if the society poison, uh, that's what leads to the destruction through crimes like uh, the genocide committed against the Tutsi in Rwanda. So the challenge now uh, in Rwanda today is with social media trends and social media power, how do we make sure there is no hate speech, no genocidal ideology in social media content? How can we preserve the freedom of speech and the freedom of opinion? And at the same time, how do we regret social media to ensure no hatred, no genocidal ideology is disseminated there? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's what I had uh, planned to share with you. Emma Claudine, thank you so much. I let you run a little bit over time because of the power of your narrative and the conversation and the two things you covered. You know, looking back in our history prior to 1994, we need to draw the lessons of the power of the media in normalizing things which we find horrific. So you describe very well how we had the normalization of hate the normalization of uh, division and conflict. And worse still, we had the normalization of murder you know, and the encouragement through, through the media. And you went on then to, to, to show how the, the current agenda and challenge is how do we normalize openness and debate? How do we normalize uh, peaceful relations as opposed to the use of violence? And we have a couple of really good questions that are already coming up from Kigali uh, Frederick, who asks about, um, are we doing enough to counter the social media pressures that are currently in existence? Your very last slide. And uh, Gan Claire in, in the UK asking, do, why is it that the, the world audience seems to be very focused on, on one set of of atrocities in one theatre and has ignored others where we have some uniform inconsistency. We'll have time for questions and we'll come back and keep posting them as you will. But thank you so much, Emma Claudine, for setting out so clearly the in incredible importance of the media in all its forms in deriving and generating trust. You know, the trust that we know is important for the future. We must 
unpick to see its origins and uh, the problems from our past. Without more ado, let me move on to Hippolyte, who's waiting so patiently. Um, and you've already been referred to by his excellent High Commissioner as an inspiration. Um, Hippolyte, you are an artist, an activist, founder of Be The Peace, which I'm sure you'll tell us about. This is an organization which focuses on the use of art to, uh, to bring cross-generational healing and the intergenerational transmission of hate to an end. Um, you're a child survivor of the genocide um, and you continue to promote reconciliation. When I first met you, I was inspired by the story of your journey, your 100 day performance across, um, across your country in commemoration of the 25 years. Here we are 28 years and we have the pleasure of uh, your residence in Coventry pursuing um, work which I know will have impact on how we build trust in fractured communities. So without further ado, um, let me give you the floor and bear in mind, I'd like us to have about 15 minutes for questions uh, before we, we finish. So welcome Hippolyte. Thank you for that generous um, introduction. I, I, I put my headphones on so that I can uh, probably comfortably speak. So I hope everyone hears me well. Um, I will just do, I will share my screen and go on to, uh, to speaking and I will use um, probably 10 or so minutes. So I, I want to talk about intergenerational healing in the post-genocide Rwanda. And I will focus, uh, of course, it's, it's a big, um, big, a big topic that has a lot of, a lot of parts of it, but I will only focus on the work that I have been involved in. Um, I'm sure there, there is a lot more happening and probably in discussions there will be a uh, chance to talk more about other examples of stra or strategies that have been used in healing in the post-genocide Rwanda. So um, to give an idea of why healing, and I mean, uh, that's an obvious question, but I'll give a bit of background on numbers. Um, the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994 left it, but it was in 100 days, and in that 100 days, an estimated um, more than a million people were killed. I have to say, um, the number that has been referred to in many, many years now by some people, by politicians, by um, different organization or academic, has been provided by the UN first time in 1998, that was four years after the genocide, even before we knew, um, even to, to, we knew how many were killed. Even today, people are still discovering um, the mass graves in Rwanda. So the, ref the reference that has been made um, of 800,000 people, it, it was, I have to say that it was, first of all published or put out by the UN, which actually left Rwandans being killed in 19, 19, in 1980, no, 1998. That was the number that, the, the number that many people in the West mostly have been inclined to use often and often. And it has been a narrative of media and academia. So, I refer to more than 1 million people because that's a number that constantly even get higher as people discover mass graves and, and discover um, families uh, that were killed and left no one to uh, even put the numbers out. So it's important also in, in, in the academia or in the conversations like this that we accurately talk about records of, of tragedies that happened. Um, and, and, and it's important to say that. So during um, these 100 days with, with a calculation of 100 days, um, having more than a million people killed, 
we 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 you can say that an estimate of than um, of six, more than six people, six uh, men, women, children, ever were killed every minute, every hour of every day. So every minute, six people were killed in 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 the course of hundred days. And between two hundred and this is an estimate two hundred fifty and five hundred women were raped during these 100 days. Approximately 300,000 children were murdered during the genocide. 95,000 Rwandan children were left orphaned. And after the genocide, more than um, 120,000 suspected perpetrators were imprisoned uh, or they were, sus they, they, they were uh, 100, 20,000 people suspected to have been involved in the genocide. Well, 75% of primary and secondary school teachers had been killed, fled, or were imprisoned. So all teachers in Rwanda, I have to say that that, I, that is why I added this uh, number, uh, this estimation or this statistic of 75%. Imagine a country where the education sector at least 75% um, of, of teachers were absent. Were some were killed, some were um, uh, in prison, or some fled the country. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. With these numbers, I, I have to say that I, I showed the numbers to, to see, to, to also put us in the position of saying, well, how do you heal that country? How do you move on healing that country? Well, among the processes, among the things that have happened, among the strategies that happened, I was involved in what, what I founded as an organization or as a movement, whatever you want to call it. It was, it, it, and I called it Be the Peace. And the story of Be the Peace traced back into my personal uh, surviving experiences of genocide when I was seven years old. And among the people I talked about, among the numbers I was just uh, sharing with you, included my dad, included my, my aunts, included family members, included children that I played football with, included um, women that I have seen killed and raped. Uh, it, I, I'm very related to those numbers. And so, uh, just at seven years old and being able to, to heal and to move on, it was even impossible. But you know, a few months after the genocide, I went into school and how, how would I really sit in class and expecting to succeed? Well, I started, um, I wanted to tell the story by help of the teacher. I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't speak for most of the time in, in class. I, I rarely spoke in, in class. And one day my teacher comes to me and say, why um, don't you speak? But luckily I succeeded. I don't know how, I, uh, how that happened because everything could remind me of everything else. Seeing a teacher, I would, it would remind me of people I've seen um, being murdered in the genocide. So I told, the teacher that I only wanted to tell the story and he helped me to create a theater for children and it was not supported any friendship of children uh, of any family was not supported by the elder uh, family members from either um, either um, either side uh, but you know when we started performing and I started using telling the story through the art poetry and and performance in primary school and that's where I started uh, healing I started individual journey of healing and telling the story um, other than that I, I, I joined the student um, student association of survivors survivors student association in high school and university where we had created families uh, artificial families in the schools so that we can um, heal each other, tell the stories, talk about the challenges, and GRG's graduate program of the similar uh, RG. And so through that, it was kind of 
general um, journey. Be the peace. Or, uh, so I moved on for the search of peace. I said, where, how can I do? What can I be involved in? So I created Be the Peace. And the idea is we work with survivors and perpetrators and their descendant. And among them, there are also some children who were born as a result of, uh, of, of um, rape in a genocide. So, uh, and we work to stop the intergenerational transmission of hate. I am standing on the photo you see, I'm standing in between two people uh, in one photo. One has killed the whole family of, uh, of that blue t-shirt. Uh, so the young person with blue t-shirt, his family was killed by the person that by the the person on my right on the photo and they have gone we're standing in a garden that together through be the peace they have uh, done as a, a way of sharing fruit and on the other photo i was walking across the whole country in 2019. Uh, i'll be fast i have a few more minutes to say and i'm sure in the conversations we will have more to have to to talk about so we continue with the same the same idea we go in schools and i would just talk about here so the we go in schools and the students use the art to tell their story of what they know what they don't know and the questions they ask and then we have conversation afterwards you see on one photo top um no uh, on a bottom uh, right side the two people who were planting a tree for peace it was one, uh, someone of my age, this young uh, person on the, on my right, on my left, on my right, on the photo, his family, he was, he was, not, he was seven years old when the genocide happened, but this man's, uh, and, and his family, his parents killed the family of this man they're planting tree together. But after the genocide, he, after hearing the stories and after hearing the story in Gachacha court, he decided as a, a young person to go and reach out to, his, to, he, to this person. And he said, we need to be together. So they're building, um, they're telling their stories in schools and they're building the community together. And we work with people who are back in, in the community who have served their sentences in prison after um, being convicted of genocide crimes and they work with survivors sometimes we they have never had a chance or they're afraid to reach out to survivors and be the peace help them to reach out to them we have seen so many people coming together because of what we do values again they we have different things that we're doing and the value are on unity as wandons and forgiveness empathy and responsibility which brings us to justice we do all the photos portray things we do as together with other different people. What I have to say in the in the search is the, 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 the we're using the community based approach, and 130 families of vegetable gardens and fruit trees that they have planted uh, through all this program, and the 243 families uh, we have 1400 for. for 243 family members and we have started the microfinance uh, uh was it last year no this year in january we started a small project of uh, 18 small projects have been or microfinanced and 16 families have been given cows and they the idea is to take tons in milking cows uh, as in Rwanda if someone gave you milk, it's a pact for friendship forever. You, they say, if someone gave you milk, you never give them blood. So it's sharing. And, and that was the, the pre-genocide um, or in, in pre-genocide or historically, it was a pact of friendship. And now, you know, we want to revive all those values. The future and what we're taking our journey, the journey continues. The healing process is not one day process. It, it goes on. It, it, what we're doing is be the peace. This land you see is in Rigesera and it, it has been acquired. And we plan as be the peace to build a um, peace center there, which will continue to strategically continue the healing and peace work. It is close to a very to two very famous 
uh, memorials. And we hope that, you know, as we, as we go on, this will be another healing center. So I thank you so much for uh, listening to me. And I'm very glad that we have some time for question. And I'm happy to go on. But what I have to say is that the healing process continues and there are lots of people and practitioners who are doing that. So we're not, we, we, it's an example of uh, which means uh, we remember, but we thrive for a better future. And thank you very much. Thank you, Hippolyte, so much, and uh, and thank you for for using your time so effectively. <clears throat> but this uh, three remarkable uh, presentations, which underline the view for me that each experience matters, the experience from the top, from the bottom, from very local, from the global. But I'm going to now um, take questions for our discussion. We had. A very early uh, intervention by Frederick from K Kigali. Hello, Frederick. I hope you're still with us. And you were asking a very, uh, very relevant question, but particularly I think aimed at Emma Claudine about what are we doing? Are we doing enough to counter the social media and the risks that this twin edged sword, social media, which both opens up our understanding and shares knowledge, but also can be used in a very hate building way? So um, do you want to add to that question or should we go straight to Emma Claudine, Frederick? So Emma, maybe you can, uh, <clears throat> you can make some comment about how we can uh, assure ourselves that social media can be used in, in an effective and balanced way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Frederick raised a really a very good question that we've been uh, asking ourselves uh, during these years. And as the government uh, office of the government spokesperson, we really trying to do uh, whatever possible to make sure that um, uh, we kind of ensure social media is not uh, harmful to Rwandan audience, which is a bit very complicated because sometimes when you want to start regulating the social media, uh, some of the countries will say you, you're denying people freedom of speech, you're denying people freedom of opinion. Uh, but because in Rwanda, we really know where we come from, we know our history, we, we, we feel like, no, we can't just let people uh, abuse, uh, abuse the, 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 the freedom of opinion that they have. Now abuse uh, the social media access to, 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 to harm the Rwandan um, uh, audience again, the Rwandan citizens. So we working with the Ministry of Local Government uh, because currently they are the one who, who can, uh, who work with the media very closely under the Rwanda Governance Board um, to make sure that we, 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 we because we, um, we, we currently, um, uh, renewing the, the, the media policy. And the questions we have for the moment are, do we include um, this social media in the media policy? Is social media the media? Uh, we know sometimes when we talk about media policy, we, we talk about the traditional media, television, radio, newspapers, uh, or some website, but we know that currently social media has really a very big trend and sometimes it has a very big impact more than the traditional media. And if the traditional media don't match it with the social media is a bit complicated to, to, to reach uh, somewhere or to, to remain the, that powerful media that can set the agenda. So we have the discussions currently and our intention is maybe to find a way we can do kind of self-regulation among the social media practitioners by beginning with the one who, who have grown their audience, the followers who have really very big impact and see if we can invite them to discuss, maybe can create their platform where they can self-regulate themselves, where they can call someone and tell, you know, these things you, 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 you really, uh, broadcasting or publishing are harmful to, 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 to Rwandans, are creating hatred, 
are um, bringing back the, the genocide or ideology. So those are the discussions that are going on. But the most importantly, with uh, the new ministry, Ministry of uh, Unity, um, uh, we, we're making sure that uh, uh, at least from the ministry, all citizens are educated. Um, they, they, they know what's bad, what's good. And the most importantly, they, they're kind of patriotic. Uh, because when you are patriotic, when you love your country, you, you would do whatever possible to make sure that uh, you don't bring the country to, to, to the situation we were in uh, during the genocide uh, against the Tutsi. So, so that's what I can say. I don't know if I have an answer, but if we think helpful. about Let, it, yeah, yeah and we try to ask. If I can just bring the High Commissioner in, um, uh, Mr. Johnson. If, we're interested also in the challenge that most societies face in protecting the accuracy of media from uh, the challenge to freedom of speech. But how does the government of Rwanda cope with this? We're very intrigued by the I am Ru Rwandan um, strategy and movement. But are there worries and anxieties about freedom of speech in, in, a, in a dilemma here when we're trying to make sure that we have accurate uh, communications? Are you still with us, uh, High Commissioner? Yes, I am still with the Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe um, I will try to explain this by throwing back and make it a conversation for all of us. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, accuracy of information vis-a-vis free speech vis-a-vis -vis free expression. If you look at the history of information and the protections that, uh, that uh, you know, need to be protected in order for information to be fair and useful for mankind, I think this is a conversation that has gone on for more than 40 years, 50 years. It's not, it's not just started in Rwanda, mm. it's not just started now. Uh, I, I think if you look at uh, World War II, if you look at uh, 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 specifically the Holocaust, you, you'll find the role of, of the media and the role of, uh, of deception and the role of disinformation uh, uh, that made, uh, you know, uh, bad things happen, bad things possible. So this is not a conversation that has just started and it, I don't think it's a conversation that uh, uh, will end. Mm. So uh, I think what is important is that there is uh, an, 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 an open and transparent process. Emma Claudine just referred to a process they have at the Rwanda Governance Board to bring in the very people who uh, trade in information, the media, mm -hmm. the social uh, pundits, the, uh, uh, the YouTubers and so on, bring them in, bring them on the table. Mm. And, and, and tell them, look, we have a story. This is a country with a story. In 1994, we, had, we did not have uh, Twitter in Rwanda. We did not have YouTube. Rwanda has added probably the whole world. Mm. Uh, but we had RTLM. We had Kangura. We had these famous journalists who were convicted by international courts. Mm. The International Criminal Tribunal convicted George Ruju, convicted Hassan Ngeze, convicted many people. Rwandan courts convicted other people. And they established precedents. They, they made very powerful legal findings, mm. these international courts. They made powerful legal findings how you use your position as a, as a journalist, as a media person, to the detriment of society. Mm. That is how they were all convicted. <clears throat> because when they went in there, they cited free speech. They cited free expression, all of them, in, in, without exception. Mm. But the, the, the courts said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, we, we, we know your free speech rights. We know where they begin and end. But while you were in Rwanda in 1993, 1992, 1994, these are excerpts of, you, of what you spoke. Mm. And they brought all of them and they read them out. And some of them were grotesque. They would mm. say, uh, Mr. So-and-so is not yet killed. 
Mm. We have checked all the bodies. We haven't seen his body. And we suspect he is hiding in a church. And the church he might be hiding in is so and so and so and so by addressing it by its own location. Mm. And in 30 minutes, in half a day, this, this person would be hunted for, would be found, and would be killed. Mm. Mm. And this happened not to one person, but to thousands and thousands of people over length of time. Mm. So the, the, the courts were very careful about the difference between your free speech rights and your freedom to express them, your, your ideas, plus the ideas that killed. And they said, well, you, your ideas were intended to kill. They were, they were not different from the machetes, the machetes that someone used to kill. Hmm. No, they were not different. So you, you, you have the right to, to go on, on social media and write what you want. But if what you are writing for a country which has a story, like Rwanda from 1994, for many other parts of the world, uh, I have seen in the last uh, couple of weeks, there are media outlets that were shut down in some of the countries on the European continent in respect of the Ukraine in the Ukraine war. Yeah. So why would that happen in Europe? Hmm. There, were, there were tweets asking what has happened? What, how, where has freedom of speech and where has the, 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 the freedom of expression gone? What is going on? So this, this uh, unlimited speech rights, uh, uh, free speech rights and, uh, and uh, uh, media freedom, it is fine to say they are unlimited. But what if that being unlimited is exploited by me if I have an agenda? Hmm. And this agenda is to kill. Sure. But I'm not going to the roadblocks to kill people. No. Mm. I, am, I am only going in my radio station and direct those who are killing people what to do. Mm. And if they don't do what I've asked them to do, the following morning, I come on the radio. And if you followed what happened in Rwanda's media at that time, they would either be telling them whom to go and kill, or they would be condemning them into you know, telling them they are cowards, they are mm. stupid, they are foolish Hutus, they are impotent, they are, they, they are good for nothing if they are not killing. Mm. So by, 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 you know, I'm on the street there and you are naming me and you are saying I'm a fool, I'm a coward, I'm impotent, I'm everything bad if I'm not killing. Mm. In the end, you know, many people will go, will go and do this. So, even that time, we still have a quarrel with the, with the United States for not jamming that radio. There was one specific vitriolic radio, which yeah. wasn't shut, which yeah. wasn't jammed. And, and we thought it was possible. And again, the debate was around free speech. Mm. It was around uh, free expression. So th th this conversation, we need to have it at a global level. And also we need to add all these elements now that we have the benefit of courts of law, international courts of law, which have clearly written down on the basis of evidence and the facts which, have, which happened in 1994. And they have said, yes, your rights are protected. Yeah, so this but, is really helpful. It's a, and it amplifies the point, Excellency, you made earlier about, this is a global issue and a global conversation needs to happen. So and, I, I uh, just wanted to make that, uh, uh, about accuracy of information. You, you will not yeah. find one straight answer written in one book, but no. if that information is inaccurate, first of all, it can be inaccurate, directly inaccurate. If you say someone is a thief and they are not a thief, then it's inaccurate. But at the same time, it can be dangerous information. Yeah, can be information that will lead someone to kill. Mm. So, so Frederick, do you, would you like to come back before we move to the next question? I see you're with us now. Would you like to make any comments or, because we have a, a really interesting question that follows on from that from Gian Claire. Claire, are you there now? Can, would you like to put your question about uh, how we tend to have selective vision sometimes in the world? 
That's good. I I think my colleague has talked about it, Emma. Yeah. Uh, but also, I want to hear from uh, High Commissioner Businge to talk about it. Mm. Good. So we've had a very a very good response, and he's brought all the experience of his legal background to to share. So let me move on. We had a question about um, from Gian Claire from Warwickshire. Are you with us still? Your question. Was yes, yes, I'm still. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm still here. Would you like to put your question? Uh, yes. Um, can um, the High Commissioner uh, comment on the fact that many NGOs and journalists and the world leaders are condoning? crimes being committed by the Russians and are rushing to expose crimes in Ukraine. And yet in Rwanda, even the international community, the United Nations Security Council and the UN peacekeeper deserted Rwanda. I, I just can't comprehend that. Here, you've got a situation where everyone are rushing to Ukraine uh, to sort of expose the crimes and yet the world community remained silent in 1994. Mm. And in fact, the, the, the French uh, peacekeepers uh, sort of deserted uh, the, the Rwandans. Uh, so there seemed to be a, a double standard by the, by, by the Western nations. Does, uh, does the High Commissioner think so? Thank you, yeah. Um, High Commissioner, do you want to make a small, a short comment? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, but let me begin with a broad one. Let me say that uh, uh, that probably what Gian is saying is the world we live in. Mm. I, I wish I could say that and stop there. I, I think that's the world we live in. I, I, I would ask him the same question if I was the first to ask the question. I would probably ask him the, the, that same question. For sure, there's no doubt that uh, when, when we needed the UN most, when we needed peacekeeping most, when we needed intervention most, intervention didn't show up. And, and, and one there is one country where uh, when the genocide started, we had presence of the UN, it's, it, including uh, troops. So it, it, it was, it's not a case where you needed to mobilize uh, a, a mission to send to a country. We already had a mission. And, and the head of that mission already was asking for more troops to, to you know, manage the task. So he already knew the task. He already warned uh, headquarters about what was about to happen. And all he needed was more troops and more capability to do the job. So, uh, and uh, as, as Gina says, when we needed uh, prevention, when we needed intervention, when we needed support most, support didn't come. And quite honestly, uh, Rwanda was one case where it was absolutely clear, absolutely clear that non-intervention will result in, 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 in the genocide. It was, nobody was in doubt. Mm. And I, I, in, in the, my remarks that I made, I referred to uh, one specific example where we actually had a Belgian contingent mm. protecting people. People simply came there because it is a, it's a, a secondary school that uh, the Belgian continent had used as its, as its base. And when people felt threatened in their homes around that area, they all came into the compound. In, in thousands, they reached probably 5,000. They came in their compound and they spent time there and they were protected and nobody dared walk in. The Interahamwe uh, militia, would only come and spend a day at the, on the fences, not daring to get in because they knew if they get in, it would be violation and they will be uh, subject of, 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 of uh, you know, they will be expelled by fire. Mm. These people felt secure mm. and they spent time there. Then one day, one morning, one fine morning, there was a decision 
They did not know where it came from. And all of a sudden, they did not matter as human beings. Hmm. They didn't. All of a sudden, nobody explained to them. All of a sudden, they just saw trucks and the Belgian troops loading their property on trucks. They suspected these people are leaving us. They went into, the, they approached them, said, oh, are you, you are leaving us. And they were, I think, instructed to be quiet. The army can have uh, uh, instructions. They said, you're not going to talk. And they were not talking, but they were loading themselves onto trucks. And these people knew, and the Virgin uh, continent knew that there was nothing, nothing whatsoever would stop them from being killed. Nothing, mm. unless simply the almighty came down. So they loaded themselves on trucks. Then these people thought if they behave in ways that show, you know, it's not possible that they can be left alone, maybe they will change their mind. They came and, and, and lay in the road. They made, you know, multiple lines in the road, lying down in the roads before in, in front of the trucks. The troops came out of the trucks and lifted them off the roads so that the, the, the trucks could go. And they left. And you should have seen the, the small, small videos that we see, the, the militias armed to the teeth, laughing all the way to their victims, mm. laughing all the way to their victims and herding them like cows out of that compound, taking them one mile down, not knowing what to do with them. There are simply too many, one group, you know, in one large place, walking them down one mile, then changing their minds, walking them up four miles to the place where they eventually killed them. It is now a genocide memorial where we, we remember the, the abandonment of the international community. But, you know, that is a day of shame. So what he is asking me, uh, I, I'm lucky I have been able to explain and describe what happened in uh, this particular example. But why the double standards, why the current uh, response in, uh, in, uh, in another place? I, I, I don't want to get into that debate right now, but uh, I'm, I'm telling you that when we needed support, when we needed uh, intervention, when we needed saving people, when only three, four guns were enough to save these people, 100, 200, 300, 400 guns left them alone. Mm. And only three or four could probably have some, you know, saved them just by people knowing if I enter this compound, it is a gated compound, there is a fence, you can only use the gate. And if you walk in by force, the Belgians will shoot you. You, you probably needed 10 guns, but in the end, 400 guns left and left them alone. And within 30 minutes, they were, they were prey, prey, just for, 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 for devouring. And what happened to them is only remembered every 11th of April. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner. A very uh, very powerful comment and it's very timely. I, I'm going to ask one more question of Hippolyte about um, projecting forward in a positive way, not to diminish at all our reflection and the empower of uh, Kribukan in terms of uh, His Excellency's descriptions. But let's finish by a comment from you, Hippolyte, about looking forward positively, what gives you optimism that such reconciliation that you describe so powerfully in your photographs is possible? Then we'll have a moment of silence before I ask the High Commissioner to close our seminar. Uh, thanks. I mean, the, uh, what, I think for myself uh, and for probably the world, uh, we should be worried about what can happen tomorrow. What happened? Yes, we know. What is happening as we see what ha what can happen tomorrow is where we have to put our minds 
too, because um, when we don't take these measures until it's too late, then it would be, we, we won't have anything to say. So individually, everyone has to say, what can I offer so that tomorrow, my descendants, so that I am an ancestor for a better future. Uh, that's, that's important for leaders, for uh, NGOs, for polit political leaders, or anyone as a leader. They have to think about their action and what they can do to prevent, uh, to, to, to be the peace, like we say, like we say in, our, in our organizational movement. So we say, we, I think it's important that we focus on what we offer so that our descendant or so that the world tomorrow is a better place, um, individually, systematically, institutionally, everything. So the future should be in the plan because the past is the past, the present is, yes, is the present, but we should be worried about the future and take actions for the future. Thank you, Hippolyte. So now might I ask us all, in this strange environment of Zoom, nonetheless, to have a moment, a minute of silence and of reflection. So thank you so much. And um, before we close, and I will give the last um, word to His Excellency, the High Commissioner. Thank you so much for your time. But a big thank you to Emma Claudine, to Hippolyte, and to all of you who've uh, participated. You know, we often say in Rising that this is um, a movement and not a moment. And I referred to that earlier. Don't stop thinking and don't stop discussing this. Send your emails, send your notes. This will be uh, posted online for we can review it again as a, as a copy. We do answer emails. We are concerned to maintain the conversation. And there's no doubt that there are huge issues for the global community to resolve. We're not fit for purpose as, as a global community to deal with these local traumas. We're seeing that in the descriptions of, of this particular 28 year old memory, but also in the contemporary world that we're experiencing. So we, the big issues are, how do we put in place the building blocks that we've heard about during our discussions today? How do we get the language right when we talk about ethnicities? How do we get our education systems working and pointing in the right directions? How do we control the media to make it a positive force for good rather than a, a, a force for for division, how do we promote healing in the way that we've heard the role that's so important? How do we maintain and pro pro promulgate the values that matter to humanity? How do we peer inside the dark places to see the humanity within? And how do we combine the bottom-up work that we've heard so much about today with the top-down work, the global community at the multinational level, must take responsibility for. Thank you for being part of today. Thank you to Emma Corley, and thank you to Hippolyte, and particularly to you, High Commissioner, for giving of your time. And let me leave you to close our webinar this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael. And thank you for the honor of uh, allowing me to say the last word and close this. Um, it's an honor that I don't take for granted. Um, this conversation 
is important in many ways on, on, on many fronts. The intellectual community, the academia, researchers, I alluded to them in my remarks. They, they, are, they are the next frontier where these conversations are going to be. 28 years ago, is not such a very short time, but at the same time, it's not a long, long time. But in the life of education, people have gone from where they were in 1994 to where Ippolit is right now. That happens to be the same for if there is a son or a daughter of a genocide perpetrator who's, who is still, you know, harbors uh, issues with the past and supports their parents for one reason or another. But if they ended up in a place where they can have education, they are now very educated and mature people. They can write books, they can address conferences, they can address webinars like this one. They can be believed by people who don't have uh, a lot of information. Therefore, their capacity to pass on denialist propaganda or denialist message is now even more refined. So a conversation like this uh, is, is so important on many fronts, not only to allow the truth uh, to be told and conversations about uh, a history of a country and the history of a genocide to be told, but also to be able uh, to get into these fora and you know, face whichever argument that anybody is presenting, uh, face it head on. Because right now you will not expect that you will get uh, in Hera Hamne at, uh, at roadblocks you not expect that you find people asking for IDs to know which ethnic group you belong to. You not expect to see leaders uh, mobilizing on the basis of ethnic differences. You are not going to see that anymore. However, once that is gone, uh, while that is gone, we still have the, these kinds of issues and social media that has uh, enabled everybody to uh, uh, send their messages across the world in one second. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this kind of forum. Uh, it, to me and to us, it is important on those many fronts. Point number two that I would like to share is that Rwanda existed thousands of years before 1994. Mm -hmm. There was no genocide at all. The same Rwandans lived together. They probably didn't live a completely perfect, uh, perfectly harmonious life. Maybe they disagreed, maybe they lived, they probably lived like any other normal human society lives. But there was not a genocide. And the story, the history we read of Rwanda talks about more unity, more cohesion, more convergence, more you know, uh, patriotism in Rwanda. Over a course of years, you know, like early 30s all the way, we see actions and omissions of human beings, mm. whether it is the Germans, whether it is the Belgians, whether it is the post-colonial government, we see actions and omissions of human beings switching a human mind of Rwandan people. And by the late 50s, Rwandans see themselves as different as one group from one planet, another group from another planet. Mm. And that is in a space of, let's say, 30 years. Mm. 
Meaning, it is the actions and omissions of man that caused the genocide. There was nothing inherently natural in the causes of the genocide. There was nothing inherently religious or inherently uh, non-preventable in the causes of the genocide. Mm. It was actions and omissions of a people, especially mm. leaders of a country. Mm. So what we do now after 1994 is to take stock of all this and then say, it is again actions of people that can reverse this situation and link Rwanda to our past, the thousands and thousands of years where we did not have a genocide. Mm. Link Rwanda to a future where ethnic, ethnic differences should not have a place in any negative sense. We not give you education, we not give you health, we not give you roads, we not give you, uh, we not give you anything. Mm. We only give you danger. We only give you tragedy. And the actions of education, the actions of reaching out, the actions of research and writing, the actions of repressing denial, the actions of justice, the actions of truth, the actions of cohesiveness, the actions of refusing anybody to turn us back into, into where we know we would fall into a, a deep hole. Those are the actions that not only spell never again, but give us a country that will be resilient. Mm. Because resilience in our case, will only be from our unity. We can, we can, we can, you know, bet on many things uh, that we, we may be able to do or not do because some things we don't control. We don't control wealth. Uh, we don't control climate. We don't control, there are many things which can come and we don't control COVID. There are many things which can come and challenge us, but we can work on unity. We can work on empowering our people, our young people, our women, our men, our partners, that us in Rwanda, we work for unity. We, we look for all sorts of ways, creative ways of, of encouraging and building it. We look for digital ways of doing it. We look for every peaceful measure of, of, of you know, building our unity. Making, making it sweet, making it, you know, you can't live without it, making it something every family treasures. Once that one is, is, is reached, and I think we are very much well on the way, then you, 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 you can very easily talk about a country where a genocide denier or someone intent on dividing you along ethnic lines will not find reception, mm. will not find acceptance. People will simply say, what's going on? Chief, go and change your mind. And if you don't change your mind, the law will be somewhere waiting for you. So the most important thing is how much education, how much awareness from this history are we getting as baggage for our future? And once we do that, we believe that the, the, the building blocks to, to deal with the, uh, all the challenges that we have, the, the media uh, and so on, we will have the building blocks. We, we, today you, you, you touch a, a YouTuber uh, because there's now a new ethnic group of people called YouTubers. We, we, never, we never had that kind of group before YouTube came. Now there is a group, uh, it's either a tribe or whatever, but when they go into uh, what you think is crossing the line, is, is divisive, is denialist, then you, you, you come again in conflict with free speech. So the future means 
opening up. We are not going to shy away from holding someone accountable. Mm. At the same time, we are not going to uh, repress, to restrict free press, to restrict uh, free speech. We are not going to do that. But what is the way to do it? It is a daily activity. It is a daily action. Every day needs to come on the table. Finally, Professor, this is global. This is for all of us. It is not for Rwanda. This is not a project for Rwanda. In 1994, Rwandans were the victims, but this was a crime that is international. That yeah. is a crime that is proscribed by a United Nations Convention. Mm -hmm. And wherever it happens, the world is obliged to act. So this is a global uh, effort. And I want to thank you very much because uh, now you are making us the global citizens that uh, you want. Uh, and th th this is part of the way of dealing with this matter. So the person in Rwanda where my mother lives now knows that they have a friend in Coventry with whom they are moving this journey. Thank you. Thank you, High Commissioner, and thank you to all our participants.